been a hot minute, but let's go ahead and do a deck profile for the Master of Gravity, Barrel Magus in DBT05. Except it's actually going to be just Barrel Magus from DBT04, because quite honestly, everything that we've gotten up to this point for Dark States really hasn't been usable for Barrel. So I think what we'll do today is we'll do four things. We'll go over my current build for Barrel Magus. We'll go over every single card that has been released for Dark States since DBT04. We'll go over the matchup analysis uh, for what it's like playing Barrel against some of the other decks that are out there. And finally, we'll, for fun, take a look at what it costs to actually play Barrel right now. Let's jump right into it. So, let's go ahead and start off with Barrel Magus himself. What even is a Barrel Magus? This is the Master of Gravity Barrel Magus here. When this unit attacks, you can counter blast one and perform all of the following according to the number of cards in your soul. If you have five or more cards, you draw a card. If you have 10 or more cards, you get 10k and a crit, this unit does. And if you have 15 or more cards, both you and your opponent put all of their own real guards into their souls, then you, the player with Barrel Magus, can pull out two cards from your soul, call into rearguard circles, and give those units 10k power to the end of the turn. So Barrel Magus is a turbo aggressive soul charging deck in uh, Dark States. And essentially your goal is to hit 15 souls as quickly as possible and just run into your opponent's face with not only a 23k Vanguard with Twin Drive and an additional crit to start with, but also five attacks since you can do uh, attacks with the rear guards, put them into your soul, and then call out two new rear guards, and then use those to attack with the additional 10k power. And that's basically been the game plan of Barrel Magus since set one. It works out really well in set four compared to set one, since there's about maybe an 80% chance that you're going to hit 15 on your first grade three turn, making this deck lethal on turn three on its first grade three turn versus some of the other grade four decks, which is what makes this deck so good is that it gives those decks a lot of trouble as they need to ride into the grade four or something like Bruce has to go into final rush, Tamayura has to go into whatever state is called. Uh, so this is a very good deck in being able to rush down your opponent in that manner. For the ride deck, we have Uncanny Burning here. I've been using Uncanny Burning since the start Something about when I opened up DBT01 and I saw Uncanny Burning, I was like, whoa, this dude looks really cool. I really like this. And I hate to be cheesy, but it felt like it kind of called out to me. Uh, same with Deep Sonicer here. We're using Deep Sonicer still. His skill is still really good on place of Vanguard Circle, Soul Charge 1. And then on uh, Rearguard Circle, uh, during your turn, if your soul has 10 or more cards, he gets 10k. So he's an anti 18k attacker or booster. Or if you call him out with Barrel Magus' skill, he's a 28k attacker or booster. Since he's in the ride deck, he's always an option for you to be able to pull it out. Then we've got ourselves Electro Spartan here. There's not really too many other great twos that you can do in your ride deck at this time. Uh, Electro Spartan is great for Barrel Magus, or specifically for Barrel Magus. When you ride Master of Gravity Barrel Magus over Electro Spartan, you can put a card from your hand into the soul, draw one card, and then soul charge one card. You can also use this in your main deck in order to turbo soul charge because on place on rear circle you can counter blast one and soul charge two and then of course we play the master of gravity barrel magus here as our grade three we'll go over the grade threes here first we have the golden combo here of four phantasm magicians curtis and four of the pandemonium tactics finally the last set of grade threes we're going to play or cards you can't see because I put them too low, but two copies of Barrel Magus in the main deck that we'll put on the side for now as we talk about these guys. These guys are what get you to 15 stole on your first grade three turn very easily because of the ride deck, as we discussed, give you a combination of six soul from their skills and them being in souls themselves. Then if you happen to have two Curtises and one Pandemonium, since you can only use one order per turn, this automatically puts you at 14 soul. So you just need to play one more thing, such as a Brainwash Twirler, in order to get you to 15 right off the bat. 
But let's go ahead and talk about Curtis first here. So this is Phantasm Magician Curtis. This is one of Barrow's best friends from BBTO1. When he's doing his place on Rigor Circle, if your Vanguard is Master of Gravity Barrow Magus, you soul charge too. He also has a skill on Rigor Circle where if your soul has 10 or more cards, you can counter blast one and all of your front row gets 5k to the end of the turn. This comes up more often than not since you're often getting rushed, which means you can actually clap back with this if you have the extra counter blast. Then next up, we have here the Pandemonium Tactics. As usual, you can just ignore everything that it says after this first line here where it says play this, counter blast one, or I should say after this, uh, <laughs> after, after the uh, first part of this <laughs> Second line here, where it just says Soul Charge 4. Because everything else here is for Bruce. We're not playing Bruce. We don't go to Final Rush. None of the rest of it applies to us. But this does let us Soul Charge 4. This is the quickest way to get to uh, to Soul Charge in Dark States at the moment. So we want to maximize on this. The fact that it's in order hurts and doesn't hurt at the same time. Because you can very easily use this. Not clog up your board with a lot of units that you'll be playing on your kill turn. Or your damage turn, I should say. Um, but it is useless in hand to guard with, so on and so forth, and it's also grade 3, so you can't use it earlier than that. Then next up, we have ourselves, you know, the two copies of Barrel Magus in the main deck. Persona Writing is pretty decent in this deck. It does give you plus one on soul, because your Vanguard, what was your Vanguard, goes into soul. Uh, the 10k is nice, especially for all your five attacks, getting an extra 10k is amazing. On top of that, it also is very, very, very tricky <laughs> because uh, I have not wanted to play main deck, main deck barrel for a very long time because it is a somewhat dead card. If it is my first grade three turn, if I have two of these or one of these in hand, I cannot advance my soul with this. However, it is still very good to have, especially if you can manage to get to 15 soul anyways, which you kind of can with this build. So now that we're deeper into DBT 4 and 5, and getting to 15 is very easy. Main deck Barrel Magus, pretty good. I only play two. Uh, usually everyone plays four copies. Uh, the usual list is basically what I have minus uh, the change here and a change with the Brainwash, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Next for the grade twos, we're gonna be playing two copies of the Keenly Ludley here. Four copies of Cutting Sword Dant Kogwa. Four copies of the Selfish Engraver, and a single copy of the Asher Da here. This is another card that is maybe not so typical in Barrow at the moment, but it is just something that I like using. The plus on soul is nice, and if you're getting rushed early, you know, being able to guard and put something in soul is ideally very good. I haven't been able to find too much use with this lately, so I might swap it out for something else. But this is the made Azure Dom. If your soul is seven or more cards in soul, this gets 5k shield, so it makes it a 10k shield. Fortunately, Given that guarding is very hard for Barrow, this doesn't help out as much as I originally thought or as much as it did maybe in set 3. Then when this is retired from Guardian Circle, you can put this into Soul. So as I said, you can guard with it, goes to Soul. Selfish Engraver has been a mainstay since set 1, since she was announced. Uh, when his attack, when his unit's attack hits, you Soul Charge 1. And then at the end of the battle that it attacked, whether or not it hit, if your Soul has 10 or more cards, put her into the Soul, this unit, and then you Counter Charge 1. So this lets you extend your plays because you can counter charge and be able to for example use up all your counter blast in one turn to get to 15 and then use her to just get that counter blast back for your barrel skill she also lets you soul charge which is nice and then her going to soul is very nice for things for example against prison so they can't uh, imprison her uh so she is absolutely a four of mainstay for now then we got ourselves here four copies of cutting sword dance quagra i looked up on like google pronunciation and that's how you say it quagra so that's how i'm gonna say it uh, i actually managed to get four of the sps which is really cool uh, they're also very cheap, so, uh, and I managed to, I think, pull two of them, or maybe, yeah, I pulled, I think, two of them, and then, uh, I just bought the other two. Anyways, uh, Kugra is amazing for Barrel Magus, one of the two pivotal cards that we got in set four here. Um, this is ideally gonna be the target you're gonna pull out with your barrel skill and also the card you're going to probably aim to put into soul if not the keen lovely with the electro spartan skill on ride so kogra says when this is placed on rigor circle you can perform all of the following according to the number of cards you have in your soul you have two effects here you can choose which ones uh you, rather you can choose to not use these one because it has a cost if something has a cost you can choose not to pay it which means the effect does not go through but if you have seven or more cards in your soul you can counter blast one Discard a card from your hand, choose a card from your soul, put it into your hand, and soul charge one. This is very good. It powers up your Swirler for one. It also lets you search out 
uh, a PG to maybe survive next turn. It can also do something even more useful than that and get you a Pandemonium Tactics from your soul. So it makes your soul sort of very useful. The Discard Counter Blast is very heavy, so typically you don't use this unless you really need to, but it is a very good option to have. Then in second skill says if you have 13 more cards in your soul, all your front row units get 5k at the end of the turn. So if you bring this out with barrel, bring out two of them, your front row gets another 10. If you persona ride with this, that's 10. If you bring out units, that's 10. If you bring them out, that's another 10. 30k to your front row. Uh, very, very good. Last card we play here is, or last grade two, I should say, is the Kingly Lovely. This is a must have uh, because without this, we just deck out and we die. Uh, we play two of these. It's pretty standard to play two of these. Some people play three. I think that's too much. Some people play just one. I think that's uh, living a little too dangerously. But she has a very rather simple skill where she says, on placed, if you have Barrel Magus as your Vanguard, you can't boss one. Choose any number of normal units. So no triggers, unfortunately, from your soul. Put them back into your deck. And then this card gets 5k to the end of the turn for each card you put back. So this is a very good sort of um, emergency button that you can press when you're running low on deck and the match is going on long, you can put this back. She's also a nice finisher because she can get really big. If you manage to put in 15 cards back from your soul, she's going to be a massive 90 something K rear guard, which is uh, quite threatening after you just pop your opponent's face a couple of times. So very neat. Then for Greyward Ones here, we play the infamous Brainwash Swirler, and finally I play two copies of the Gormon. So, uh, usually you have about two flex spots for Barrow. Uh, some people play Gormon, some people play extra copies of other cards. It's usually four Swirlers, four of the... It's basically four Swirlers, four Kagura, four Curtis, four of the Pandemonium, two Keenly Lovely, four of the Selfish Engraver, and then whatever else you want it to be. Um, I don't like playing four copies of Swirler as much. While he is an amazing card, he is not very good at late game, so I don't like drawing into him. And I felt that three has just been a good enough number for me. Brainwash Swirler says, uh, when his unit is placed on Rigor Trigger, you soul charge one. Then when your card is put into the soul by soul charge, if you have a Vanguard as great through greater, this unit gets 5k. So you can place this earlier to soul charge, it won't get the 5k, but as it says here uh, with the helper text, if you ever so charge, if you so charge two, for example, it does stack. So you get 10 instead of two. So you can do this on your big turn if you manage to play your Curtises and also your Pandemonium Tactics. You can give this guy a whopping 4k very easily, which makes him a very good booster or attacker, which is also an option. Uh, However, the Soul Charge is mandatory. You can bring this out with Barrel's skill if you'd like. If you somehow feel, you know, risky enough, it is going to be a nice 23k attacker. If you have a Kogura, it can make it 28, which isn't half bad. Especially if you use Kogura's skill, it can make it 33. But you're also Soul Charging a lot. Typically, you don't want to Soul Charge too much once you hit 15, because you're uh, going to put yourself in danger, kid. Next up, we've got here Designer Devil Gourmand here, the card that uh, taught me how to read. So, what this does, you can ignore the first part of the skill because we don't play greed on but if this is put from rear guard into your soul by a vanguard's ability if your opponent's vanguard is grade three or greater you can counter blast one and until the end of that turn when your opponent would call cards from guardian circle they must call two or more at the same time so this means if your opponent is trying to guard after you've done your barrel magus skill to put everything in soul the next three attacks including barrel's vanguard attack they're gonna have to guard with two or more if they want a pg they're gonna have to spend an extra card so this is very good for ripping cards from your opponent's hand. Uh, this works really well with the nature of Barrel Magus being able to be active on turn three and also getting rushed down, which gives you enough counter blast to actually make use of this and also hit your 15 soul and use Barrel's skill. This also makes it very difficult for those grade four decks to be able to do anything because they will either die to this or they will have a very, very small hand and a lot of damage to this, which means they might be able to clap back, but usually they need more than a few cards in hand. And since grade fours that they try to mulligan for don't have any shield, this does a lot of damage to them. The triggers, I will say, are a little bit more, I guess, American or Western or maybe Eastern is the word. Uh, but we've got ourselves seven crits, four of the soul charging crit. 
we got ourselves four of the new and then four of the normal heals. We'll go over the newer heals in a later section. Uh, we do play four of the PG here. You can discard a card to basically make a unit not get hit for that turn so it's a perfect guard and if you have two or, or, uh, or rather if you have one or less cards in your hand you don't have to discard which is very good especially for barrow since you typically don't have a hand and then we are playing the the hades dragon deity of resentment uh, galagamed held or whatever the hell you can play the Krail Elemental overtrigger if you'd like it does work very well because the few units you bring out will get 100 million and that is pretty huge but if you check this early, this is way better because for the rest of the game, all of your vanguards get 10k and a crit during your turn, which is pretty huge. This trigger lineup is somewhat standard. Um, if you don't see this, instead what you'll see is that these three triggers were replaced with the normal draw trigger. In essence, playing seven draw or six or something around that those lines. And uh, that sounds crazy to maybe some people, but if you play Barrel Magus, you know that you're playing so many cards from hand that you need a lot of resources in order to get any cards back and everything makes you discard so it's very hard to just have any cards in hand as well as lets you turbo into getting all the pieces you need so that once you hit your grade three you can very easily hit your 15 and go ham that's why seven draw barrel is a thing i decked out playing six draw or uh, six or five draw. <laughs> I think it was five draw a couple of too many times So I'd swap out my last draw for a crit and it's been working out really well because it lets me be a little bit aggressive early on And that is the deck for barrel magus like I said, it's pretty standard uh, The minus the few changes that I mentioned is basically what you see for barrel magus and that's basically because that is more or less the best way to play Barrel Magus right now. As I mentioned, we'll be going over every single card that's been released for Dark State since DBT-04. Uh, but to be honest, DBT-04 is really what made Barrel really good. And none of the support after DBT-04 has been anywhere near as good as what we already have. However, that is going to drastically change, I feel, in sets 6 and 7. But we'll talk about those when they come. So, I want to do something for fun here. We're here on TCG Player. I've got 50 items in my cart, 50 cards. I've put basically my entire deck, lowest rarity, on in my cart to see how much it would cost. Uh, without the shipping, it is about $150, which is a shocker, considering how relatively cheap it is to play Barrow. The reason that this price is so high right now is just because of one freaking card that has jumped up astronomically in price. If we take a look here, for my build specifically, I am playing Steam Mage Asher Da. You can replace this again with anything else that you want, but Asher Da is only, uh, you know, 45 cents. <laughs> I've taken the base, the lowest rarity that I can for everything. Um, we've got here the Gormon which is only 14 cents, so you can very easily play three Golem on if you'd like. Uh, jump this down a couple of cents here. Uh, the draw triggers are actually relatively cheap right now. They were actually really expensive before. Not really expensive, but they were more than a dollar. Now they're only 89 cents. Now's a good time to pick them up. Uh, we've got the over trigger here. So the over trigger here is a little expensive. It is uh, $11. It is cheaper than all the other over triggers, I'll say that much, but I think it's the second cheapest. Uh, I think the Storkeo one right now is a little cheaper. But you can always just play the Kralom into one and make this basically zero. Because <laughs> they both work. So if you're on playing on a super budget, uh, that comes in and like everything. If not, you can order it. It's usually like a cent because everyone has like made the copies of you. I can send you one because I have so many of them. And it works really well in Barrow. Because if you check that, uh, the two units that you call out, they hit for 100 million power, which is pretty good. Not gonna lie, two units with 100 million power is better than one. Barrow himself is actually 175. You can get yourself uh, multiple copies of it if you'd like. Um, get the extra copy as well. Won't cost you as much as maybe some of the other boss units, uh, which is, you know, pretty decent. In general, the main deck, like ride line bosses, don't cost too much in Overdose, which is pretty nice. Then we've got the rest of your ride line here. All, <laughs> all of these don't even add up to, you know, a dollar and they're all only one copy each because they just go in each in the ride deck. You can get more copies of them if you want to, but even then you're not really spending too much. 
Uh, you got lucky here, this uh, Iceberg Hobbies, not, <laughs> not affiliate or anything like that, but they are selling it all, so you can all get it in one, avoid the huge shipping cost of having to get it from multiple different uh, places, different packages as well. Your main play uh, enabler here in the Pandemonium Tactics is a little bit more expensive right now, it has jumped up in price, I think it was a little bit cheaper, so it is, you know, a tiny bit expensive, not as bad as like any other staples in other decks. You can possibly even get this from like your friends. They probably have a couple of these lying around. They might even be able to give you for free. The critical trigger here, unfortunately, Steam Deviate is really good for the deck. You can just get around with the other crit triggers if you'd like. Steam Deviate does help you out a lot because uh, your main game plan is usually going Curtis Curtis Pandemonium, but that puts you at 14 soul with the ride line. You always need usually just that one bit to get you over. If it's not with a brainwash roller, you can have the Steam Deviate, boost, hit, go to soul, give you 15. Uh, it also is very nice just having that in battle. Your opponent might think like, oh, okay, he's not gonna hit 15, boom, hit 15. Um, but it is at $3 right now, so there's a little pricing. But like I said, you can get away with just using normal crit trigger. Um, then we've got the Kogra, just a dollar. You can get four of these very easily. The Finty Slasher, for some reason, is a dollar. You can probably, instead of the Finty Slasher, because I just put this, this is what I have. Uh, instead, you can grab yourself a copy of the... Uh, I want to say Mimish, but that's the... Um, <laughs> the Mai Mai, I think is what it's called. Uh, Mimish is the Lyrical Friendship Girl. Uh, you can probably get that from the Start deck. That's probably dumb cheap, because it's from the Start deck. Uh, instead of the Finty Slasher. Then we've got ourselves Curtis. Curtis is actually a dollar, which is a little bit shocking. Um, this is one of those other cards that I'm sure people can just give you because it's only good for Barrow. It's a common, people have plenty of these. The PG goes up and down in price. Uh, it's usually between three and seven dollars. Um, so this one's a little bit, something a little bit pricey you can get. You can get away, I would say, with the starter deck PG, but to be honest, this PG is really good for Barrow because you usually don't have a lot of cards in hand. Um, so that effect of not having to discard when you only have uh, one or less cards is really good. But again, you can get away with the normal PG if you don't want to pay this price here. Kenny Ludley is just 20 cents. You only need two of her, so that's really good. Um, self Engraver is a dollar. This is a must, I would say. Um, unfortunately, a dollar isn't too bad for a four of. And uh, it's another, again, a common. Might be able to get that from somewhere else for cheaper than what's on TCG Player. This is the uh, the jerk that's driven up the prices. I think he might be more expensive than he is right now. We'll come back to him. And then the, the uh, Steam Scala, you can play again. Probably the starter deck heal. And that'll probably save you a couple of cents. Uh, if we take out the Swirlers, which unfortunately, if you play, I'm only playing three of them. If you play four of them, it's even more expensive. It's closer to $80. Uh, he's $70. If you snap him out and don't use him, take out the Over Trigger um, as well. That takes off $90 from what was a $150 deck, which makes Barrow really easy to play uh, and pick up, making him a really nice budget deck. And you're basically comprised of a bunch of commons and a few rares, not too many triple rares. Um, so, uh, from a price uh, budget standpoint, Barrow's very good. If you ignore Brainwash Swirler. Right now, he's actually at $20, uh, which is good. So, that's a little bit better, but that's still a lot for something you need three or four of. Uh, there are a few copies, uh, there are a few cards they can use to sort of replicate what Brainwash Swirler does, which is a little bit you know, way cheaper. Uh, obviously, you can use the Deep Sonicer that we have in the right deck to sort of get the power buff that a uh, Brainwash Warrior does. But if not that, there is the, the Gun Ram here, which is a double rare, but it's actually 35 cents. Relatively cheap, market price is relatively low. Does the first part <laughs> of Brainwash Warrior where on play so charges, so you do get the soul from it. You just don't get to hit as big numbers as you would with Brainwash Warrior. Uh, but at the same time, your wallet doesn't get hit with as many big numbers as you would if you did with Brainwash Swirler. You can also swap out the new draw trigger for the, you know, old draw trigger. This is the uh, starter deck one, relatively cheap. Likewise, this is the other crit trigger that I was talking about, relatively cheap. It's uh, half the price of the Fenty Slasher. Uh, you can also just buy the start deck, pay $5, get four of these automatically. Uh, maybe three, I don't remember. You can also instead use maybe the um, front trigger if you'd like. 
uh, that is also an option. And then finally, the heal trigger is way cheaper than the one I use. Again, it doesn't really matter too much um, because the price isn't too huge, but you can save yourself a couple of dollars here. I just want to have, you know, a quick look. Take a look at what it's like to play Barrel. Barrel is definitely the most budget-friendly deck. Minus Spring Swirler. Um, in Overdress right now, it's not a very expensive format for the most part. I think really the only expensive decks are maybe Bastion, uh, Nirvana, Buff Sagra for some reason, and uh, Pure Light used to be pretty expensive, but most of its pieces have gone down. And even then, uh, I think these decks are all less than $100 or about $100 tops more or less, you know, maybe $120, like $80 between $120, something like that. So, um, just wanted to bring that up. And yeah, Barrel's pretty cheap. And he's pretty good. <laughs> Getting a lot of bang for your buck with this one. So let's go over everything that's been released for Dark States since DBT04. We'll start off with the promos here. This is one of the newer promos here. This is Diabolos Crusher Warren. Uh, this says, when his unit attacks if you're in Final Rush. All right, goodbye. Next up, we've got ourselves here, the Balance Wiggler. I always really liked the art of this card and was hoping we would get this soon, but this was actually the BSF promo. So this says, when this is placed on rear guard circle, counter boss one, from all the following, according to the number of your opponent's rear guards. So if they have two or less, she gets 5k. If they have three or more, choose one of your opponent's rear guards and retire it. I don't believe you can do both. So if you were, for example, to counter blast, they have three retire, then she gets 5k, but it might be the case, considering it's worded that way. Um, this isn't really great for us. We need the counter blast for other things. Retiring is really not an issue, since we can just put it into the soul and not deal with it. So, not the best. We have a couple of other cards that I'll show on screen now. There are two promos that I don't own. Uh, there is the Snake Charmer Poisoner here. When he's going to attack, hits a Vanguard. If your soul has seven or more cards, choose one of your opponent's rear guards and retire it. I do like this as a grade two, and that it is essentially a free retire. Um, but it doesn't really matter too much for us. The only things, like there are very few targets that we don't want to go into our opponent's soul. Uh, and even then, I feel like those are might just be like the... Trickstar, I think, is easier to come back from drop, isn't it? Yeah, and I can't choose Trickstar anyways. So I don't know how really good this is. Um, but again, it is nice that it is free. Then the last promo we have here is the Execution Dragon Warpole Scythe Dragon. This says, once per turn, Soul Blast 2, choose one of your opponent's rear guards and retire it. Once again, retiring is not really what we need. And then when an attack hits, you can Soul Charge 2. You may Soul Charge 2. So you don't have to do it, which is nice. It's optional. Um, there is a grade 2 that does the same thing, at least the second part of this skill, which is probably a little bit more feasible. But I don't think this is very usable either. And next up, we got ourselves the Chaos Hero 1 with Profound Mercy and Chaos. So you can play this instead of the Uncanny Burning or any of your other starters. I've been meaning to swap out my starter for something else just because as soon as I flip it up, people see Uncanny Burning and they go, Ah, this is Barrow. I need to pound this guy's face in like he owes me money. Otherwise, he's going to flush me down the fucking toilet. And uh, Chaos is one of those things you can try. Maybe people will be like, oh, wow, look at this guy trying to play Chaos and maybe let their guard down and then get their right cheeks clapped. So that is an option, I guess. Next up, we've got the Grade 1 in Chaos. So you can technically try and use this in the Ride deck as opposed to maybe Sonic or something else. However, this is only useful if you ride it over the Grade 2. So this says when you roll upon by the Grade 2 Chaos, you reveal two cards from the top of your deck, put all normal units from among them to your soul. So this already soul charges more than Sonicer, but it's only normal units. So if you get triggers or something like that, they don't go into your soul. Which, on the one hand, sounds nice. You get to keep your triggers. On the other hand, you don't soul charge as much. You can just completely whiff, not soul charge anything. Then next up, we've got ourselves Quagmire of Solace Chaos. This is useless for you, because you can only get this skill after you ride over with the Grade 3 Chaos. So this does nothing for you. Next up here, we've got Clumsy Assistant. Uh, when this unit boosts, if your soul has 5 or more cards, you counter boss 1 and this unit gets 10k to the end of that battle. I mean, sure, but uh, we can get power other ways and we kinda need to counter blast. Got myself like a 
paper cut yesterday from a tournament I was in. Um, I say paper cut, but it was from my sleeves that are just really thick and sharp. Uh, then we've got ourselves here, Flaming Pony. This is one of the cards that I think might see some play in Barrow. Uh, so, from your soul, you can bind this card to Soul Charge 2. What does this mean? If you Soul Charge this, you remove it, Soul Charge 2. This doesn't mean you Soul Charge 2, because you're removing something from Soul. Uh, so this basically just means you get to Soul Charge 1, which isn't half bad, because it's passive. It's for free. It's just for Soul Charging it. You know, you Soul Charge it with anything, you can then take this out, Soul Charge again. So it kind of makes your uh, Curtises, Soul Charge 3, your Pandemoniums, Soul Charge 5, and it makes your Brainwash Roller, Soul Charge 2, which is kind of nice. However, this does get removed, so if you wanted to try and bring it back with, let's say, Akini Dudley, it does give you less normal units to bring back, so there is that. Um, but it is, I think, a very valid option, especially in those few text blots that I was talking about. You can put this in. I'm thinking of playing this instead of Ashrodal, but we'll see. Next up here, we've got the Amazement Magician. Amazement Magician is very cool, very simple. Grade 2, when his unit attacks, you may Soul Charge 1. So she is essentially your Ig Speller, except she doesn't have to attack Vanguard, and she doesn't even have to hit either. So I think this card is very good. Uh, you just swing, Soul Charge, and that's it. It doesn't have to hit. Doesn't nothing else matters. Just attack anything. You soul charge if you want. You know, Expeller makes you soul charge uh, even if you don't want to. So I think this is just way better than Expeller. Aside from the fact that Expeller has his in soul skill, which honestly you don't really go into very much. So this is another maybe option just to give you a little bit of early pressure and then soul charge. Next up, we've got this thing, Indicate Animal Dragon. When placed on River Circle, reveal the top card of your deck, and if there are no cards with that same card name in your soul, you soul charge one. I wasn't really sure how this worked, but I'm pretty sure it's the card that you revealed you just put into your soul. Not ideal. It is a free soul charge, but I mean, just play another Brainwash Oiler or something like that, is what I would have to say. Then we've got uh, one of these things here, the Steam Ripper Nynia. All of the nations got one of these cards where they're 9k grade twos and they become 15k intercepts. I believe that actually Stokia got two of these technically. So, when it's unit intercepts, if your soul has five or more cards, she gets 10k shield to the end of that battle, which is nice. Uh, if she was a 10k attacker, it might actually be a little bit playable. Uh, in early games, you can bring this out from your soul. Granted, it still can be technically playable. You can bring this out from your soul with Barrow. Uh, it'll have 19, so it still swings at fan, assuming there's no triggers that were checked. And it uh, becomes a 15k intercept after that, which, you know, isn't half bad. Uh, even if your opponent ends up attacking this, that's fine. That's one less attack at your face you have to worry about. So, may might be playable, maybe. Next up, we've got here the heal triggers here. So this is the first heal trigger, uh, Incorporable Holy Light Euthidia here. So this one is if your opponent's attacking unit has stood you get 15k extra shield, make it a 25, but its base is 10. The heals are very interesting, because the biggest problem Barrel Magus has is that you have no cards to guard with. You will have no cards in hand. So whatever cards you have in hand have to be worth a lot, essentially. So you basically need cards that do the work of multiple cards, is what I'm trying to say. And this kind of fulfills that, right? Because this counts as a 15k, plus another 10k shield, which could either be an Astro Da or your draw trigger, or in most cases, two other cards in hand. So this kind of counts as two additional cards, which is, in theory, very good. And getting as much extra guard as you can with Barrel, with as little cards as possible, is also very good in Barrel. So I think for Barrel specifically, these heals are very good. Which ones exactly, I don't know. I know... Prison is kind of a weird matchup, and they do get a lot of crit, but I don't think that the uh, 15k from the other heal here, which is the other heal, which instead of the unit has an additional crit, not from a trigger, uh, you get the extra power. I don't think it matters for that. Um, so this might be a little bit more useful, but even then, numbers might not even be big enough where the 15k shield of the regular heal might be better. But uh, I might experiment with this, we'll see. Um, but I do think that they do see more value in Barrow 
possibly, than any of the other decks. And we got ourselves a grade one here, Steam Maiden Barney here, with the nice little to choose typo. Uh, so this card is very interesting. Uh, on place, from hand, only from hand, not from soul. If you have eight or more cards with different card names, very difficult to use in barrel, you can count on minus one, choose a grade one or less from your soul and call it minus one in soul. <laughs> so not very great. Uh, and if you have ten or more with different names, you can choose basically grade three or less. So you can technically get a column with this. Is that really worth it in Barrow, especially with the Counter Blast and having to have different names in your soul? I don't think so. Um, you can technically refund the cost if you pull out a Brainwash Swirler. Then it does become 13, it becomes a 20k column. Um, but I don't think the Counter Blast is really worth it, unfortunately. Next up here, we've got Amazing Frost here. I don't think this is actually going to be great either. Uh, so when is this on place on record server? You Soul Blast 1 to draw a card. Don't really want a Soul Blast. Drawing, mm, questionable. In Barrow. Um, it is good. You can use this, you know, regardless of Vanguard, you can use the Grade 2. Uh, then you choose a card from your hand and put it into your soul, which may or may not be good, depending. Uh, Barrow doesn't really have a lot of cards that it wants in soul, per se. So I don't know how useful this is. Then if you have 8 or more cards with different card names, it gets 5k. If you have 10 or more, it gets another... 5k, making it 10k. Uh, the power buff is nice, but I don't really think that the different card names is really going to work out for Barrow, since as I went over earlier, uh, not only in my build, but in the, you know, typical build for Barrow, you play a butt-ton of 4 ofs, so I don't think Amazing Frost really can see any feasible play. Then we've got the cool-headed ex uh, Executor Mikani here. Mikani says, uh, we can't use the bottom part because we didn't play Chaos, it just says when placed on rear circle, so it can be from Soul, kind of a Soul Blast, one of, and choose one of your opponent's rear guards with the same grade as the card you Soul Blasted and retire it. Uh, again, don't care too much for Soul Blasting, or sorry, don't care too much for retiring. Not so much Soul Blasting either, to be honest, and to Counter Blast on top of that. Uh, don't think that's really useful for us. We've got here the two Direful Dolls. These are the cards that annoy me the most when it comes to support for Dark States. Because a lot of people like to think like, oh, hey, maybe you can use this in Barrow. No, don't use this in Barrow. <laughs> so, Rimri and Romery, they both say, when this is placed on Rearguard Circle, if you have the other one, uh, you can choose to activate this skill. Uh, so, with Barrow, you can technically use both skills, but uh, you technically can only use this skill. Because uh, uh, Rimri says, you can Soul Blast 2, choose an opponent's rear guard and put it into their soul. We already did that. Uh, so you would have to just play this from hand and then play this in order to do that, but our deck does that naturally. So we don't really need to Soul Blast either. Then this says Soul Blast 2 to draw a card, which isn't half bad, but it means I have to bring out the Remory alongside with it, uh, which I would rather bring out a Kurt Ra, unfortunately. So as much as I like the dolls, we really can't use them. If we had access to this second skill, the Glitter one, where if you guard they go to Soul, then these might actually be a little bit more viable, but not so much in Barrow. Then we've got Chaos. Um, he doesn't really do much for Barrow. Um, if you, for some reason, play this as your main Vanguard, play the uh, Chaos line, and then somehow switch over to Barrow, you can make use of its first skill, which lets you uh, discard a card from your hand. Look at the top three. Choose one, put it into your hand. Choose one, and uh, call it, and put everything else in your soul. So it does give you some flexibility in doing that. You can then, for example, get the barrel and then ride over it next turn and attack with it. But missing out on the main thing that makes barrel good, which is that it's live on turn 3, would not be that great. And as a rear guard, Chaos doesn't do much for you. Uh, then we're going into Festival Collection here. We have the Desire Doll Kito here. Um, so this says, when it's put into your soul by your Vanguard's ability, choose a card from your drop, put it in your soul. So this isn't actually horrible. Um, the only thing is that the only way you can put stuff into your soul with Barrow means you're already at 15, so it doesn't really give you much, but it does let you recycle something like your Kogras, a PG that you can search out with Kogra, uh, just gives you extra soul in general, so this isn't a horrible option either, it just doesn't give you a lot of value other than just being a booster before it goes into soul, and it doesn't do anything in soul either. Next up, we've got ourselves here, Diabolus Boy Nile. If you attack with Bruce, so we can't use that, never mind. Are you kidding me? 
She was here the whole time. <laughs> I ordered another copy of this because I was like, I know I have this card. I know I did. I remember seeing it and really liking the art. And she was just stuck behind Nile this entire time. I, I don't believe this. I'm going insane. Anyways, next up, we've got ourselves Diablo's Diver Emmett. There's a place on Rearguard Circle. Count of us one. Choose one of your... Nope. Says Bruce. Can't use that. Uh, next up, we've got ourselves Diablo's Madonna Megan. When is you attacks if you're in Final Rush? Can't go into Final Rush. Goodbye. And then the last card we got here is Desire Devil Defoon. Defoon. Uh, when is this placed on Rigor Circle? If your Vanguard is Greedon, okay, never mind. When is you attacks if your stall has two or more Greedons? All right, never mind. So, in conclusion, there's really not too much you can use from the support so far. In set six and seven, a lot of the Dragul stuff. Uh, drag jeweled stuff seems to be very playable in barrel, especially that grade one that can attack 13k and go into the soul. That is, I think is gonna be very pivotal for barrel because it gives us an early way to aggress and also get plus one on soul without having something on board. So our opponent can't damage deny us either because they can't attack his rear guard because that rear guard is gone. So there's a very, very, very good card, I think, that you'll probably have to squeeze in somehow. Other than that, there's a lot of other pretty cool options. We'll go into that once those are released and I have some time to play around with it. But, you know, there's nothing necessarily groundbreaking over the cards we just went over, which is why Barrow has remained the same after set 4 into set 5 and Festival Collection. Now let's take a quick look at a Barrel Magus matchup analysis featuring decks that are both mostly being used right now and also some of the other decks that I feel like just show up from time to time and specifically stuff that you might see in let's say BRO and I've updated the tiers here to make it you know make a little bit more sense I posted a like preliminary list of this on Twitter and it confused a lot of people <laughs> the way that I had listed it so this should be super clear now um, so the way that this works is that we have five different tiers in the middle uh, you'll see that it's evenly matched so it's 50 50 so anything in this tier is a pretty even match it can go either way the higher you go up the more likely or the more advantage Barrel Magus should have in that match, just based on both how Barrel Magus plays and how the other opposing deck plays. And the lower you go down, the more difficult that matchup is. And I'm basically, I'm basing this off obviously my own experience and my rough understanding or my maybe more in-depth understanding of what the other deck does, but also on three main criteria. One is whether or not they affect Barrow getting 15 soul so if they have stuff like let's say prison that can make me get stuff out of soul or you know anything that would impede my plan uh two is whether or not they can survive a big barrel turn so this is the combination of me getting in my big swings whether or not this deck can survive that and also whether or not they can survive the board wipe right and then three the final criteria is whether or not i can survive their clapback so if I don't kill them on my big barrel turn, can I then survive their big numbers or multiple attacks the next turn? So those are the main three criteria for determining how high or how low uh, the ride lines, I was gonna say clans, but the ride lines go on this list. So let's go ahead and get started. Right off to the top here, you can see some of the decks. Uh, obviously, Barrel Magus is gonna be evenly matched. We're basically gonna be playing pound for pound, the same deck, minus one and two cards, right? Um, probably if you play, I want to say like more Golmon or maybe uh, more like Guard Restrict, you probably have an advantage over the Barrel player that doesn't, but it's a pretty even match there. Uh, then we've got here Baba Sagra here. So Baba Sagra is a strange one, um, because... <sighs> In theory, I thought this would be a good match for Barrel, but I think it's actually a really bad match based on a couple of factors. One, Bubsour kind of needs soul, uh, and not so much even to retire my units, because it doesn't matter for Barrel. You know, you at most usually only have the two rearguards in front, usually Quagras or something you don't really care about, so they can go, it doesn't really matter to you. Uh, but her getting the crit is pretty huge, as well as the power and you just giving her soul for that kind of sucks. She can also very easily get her, you know, most of her resources back uh, with things like Trick Moon constantly coming back. So she doesn't really care. She can easily soul blast it out, get a crit, bring back Trick Moon. So you really didn't hamper her too much. And uh, she can get some really huge attacks with Trick Moons. 
Granted, you know, you do hamper her a little bit, but I'm gonna put this as a rough match just because those big numbers and crits are really hard to block. This is one of the decks that made me consider using the new crits because maybe then you can block the uh, her crits, but it's not gonna be enough. Uh, the next up, we've got Nirvana here. Nirvana is another deck that I always thought Barrel had a really good matchup against, and that being because of the fact that Trickstar can get sucked into the soul, can't overdress, Nirvana can't really do anything. However, now they do have some pretty good ways to get it out of soul. Um, the is it Esper idea? The Grade Four can very easily soul blast it out. Um, they also have the Amelia now to very easily double damage ping you and evolve it from a, a turn four deck to a turn three deck with the fact that they can just easily ride Nirvana and then ride the other Nirvana with Amelia. Um, and the fact that they have five attacks that can sometimes be pretty hefty. I'm actually gonna put this as a rough match as well. If they don't have the Amelia, I would probably put it here. And if it was like maybe set three, Verena without Esper idea, I'd probably have the advantage. But yeah, right now Nirvana's pretty good, so we're gonna put it down here. Uh, that isn't to say that you can't win this match. It's more like, it's, it's very like in the middle here. Uh, I almost wanna say evenly matched, but just basing it on my criteria, I don't really think you can survive their big turn, honestly. The damage pings hurt a lot. Um, at the same time, they don't really do too much early game. It's usually just overdress um, arts and get two attacks in that way. And that's usually about it. Uh, and their first grade three turn used to not be anything. But now that they have the Amelia, it is pretty much their grade four turn. Uh, the big suck does hurt them a tiny bit but not as much as it used to and um you can do a lot of damage to them because if they have a whole hand of like you know melias uh the grade fours all the multiple grade fours that they play stuff like that then yes you can do a lot of damage but I th i'm gonna just put it here for now next up we have here tamayura um so tamayura doesn't really get hurt too much from you putting stuff in soul and her order is kind of annoying but it doesn't really hurt barrel specifically because you give it a lot of tens everywhere so minusing 10 to your front row isn't the worst thing as opposed to other decks because you're always basically giving everyone plus 10 if not from kogra from barrel's skill from persona riding using kogra multiple times um and uh I'm gonna actually put this up here. We actually, I think we have the slight advantage over this um, because I don't think Tamayura can really keep up with the pace that Barrow can bring, especially since Tamayura is technically a turn four deck because you can't actually get access to her like the heavenly goddess, whatever the fuck it's called, uh, power until you know your ride phase of the next turn. So she's technically turn four, Barrow almost automatically has an advantage because he is turn three and he can do a lot of damage turn three and you know hamper your opponent's hand and field by the time they actually get to do anything um so i'm gonna put this here and next up we've got ourselves bastion prime um bastion's here i almost want to say here but there's just no in hell you survive a bastion prime turn if they get going but the thing with bastion is that they kind of have to play around barrel because if they go first uh, they really can't do much on their first grade 3 turn. And Bastion doesn't do anything turn 1 or 2, because all they have is grade 3s. They don't play, they usually don't really play any grade 2s or 1s. So all they do is swing Vanguard twice, and that's it. Um, when it comes to turn 3, then they can usually be really explosive, and then next turn finish you off. But we negate that. Uh, unless they manage to kill us off that turn, we can negate that by the sheer fact that they're going to lose all of those resources that they just plop down when we, you know, going for the big suck. Uh, not to mention all of our big, big attacks, and if we actually have the, you know, capability of rushing them down, uh, it makes this a pretty bad matchup for Bastion, but a really good matchup for Barrow. Um, I almost want to put it here, but I'm pretty sure it's more likely here since uh, you, you can, you do have the tools to win this match uh, as a Bastion player. And then next up we have PBO here. I'm pretty sure PBO is gonna be popping up quite a bit. I think in, in BRO it's pretty much the deck that everyone's been playing from what I've seen. Coming out of set five, not a lot of people really play Tamayura. Thought Tamayura was gonna be more popular, but she really didn't, from what I've seen, she hasn't really be, uh, propped up too much. 
But PBO is uh, interesting, because um, what it can do is it can, can get a crit consistently, and it can do four attacks. Um, but that's not really too threatening, um, as opposed to like Bafsagra's big attacks, or like um, Nirvana's five attacks. And um, I kind of feel like they kind of want a board, uh, so we're going to put it here, because it's, it's in this weird situation where they can technically just sit and farm their hand with like Blaster Dark, because they don't have to command a lot of cards in hand. Uh, but once I wipe that, then they have to start committing cards in hand. And uh, then it's not too great for them. But uh, I don't want to say it's evenly matched. I'm pretty sure Barrel has the advantage just based on how PBO plays. It doesn't really do anything too crazy that Barrel can't handle, as opposed to you know some of these other decks. So I'm pretty sure Barrel has the advantage here. Then we've got ourselves here, Thegreon. Uh, I'm using the grade zero to count as both Thegreas here. Um, Thegra, I feel like, has a really bad matchup against Barrow as well. While it does have the big Persona Ride numbers and can constantly get, you know, pretty decent hand size and swing in for some pretty solid numbers, uh, she kind of needs a field to get going doing anything. Um, even though she has, like, that Gold Paladin style where she can call out two cards, if you lose all that and then all you're stuck with next turn is just Dark Fegria and no way to call out, you know, resources, um, then you're in a bit of a rough spot. Uh, if you have just a, the Arthwin, he only swings in for uh, 25. You know, these are numbers Barrow can actually guard 25. Maple swinging in for 20 after the Persona Ride. We can actually guard that. <laughs> so that's actually within range. Uh, so I'm going to put this up here. The Dark Thegra is kind of spooky, but it's not really that threatening compared to everything else. Gravidia's, um, I'm going to say evenly matched. Uh, I've faced off Gravidia quite a couple of times in Barrow. Obviously, a lot of these are based off, you know, if I've actually faced the deck, but if not, it's just conjecture on my part. But I've actually played Gravidia quite a couple of times in Barrow, and it seemed really easy to me. Uh, so even that I've actually, I've, I've lost to Gravidia and won to Gravidia. <laughs> and it was all just about the same thing. Um, and I feel like the match is pretty even. Um, then being able to, you know, use the order on grade 2, get the Shadow Army token, does make it so that we can possibly have like 4 3 damage um, before we get to Barrow or something like that, which kind of does suck. And... At the same time, we don't have to worry about their uh, burrito getting really huge because at most they're going to be able to retire two of our units unless we kind of whiff, don't hit 15, play out a lot of cards, just try and go for game, then they can actually retire a bunch. So we don't have to worry about the burrito as much. Uh, Gravidia can be a threat, so if we manage to farm a PG from uh, Kogra, we're in a good state, everything else is relatively blockable unless they hit the over trigger, then that's kind of a different story because they just makes everything become ridiculous. Um, so I think this is an Eevee match. I don't think it's rough. Um, I, I want to say Barrow has the advantage, but the big suck doesn't hurt Gravidia as much. They really just need like, you know, two cards on field or something like that. They don't really need a huge board presence. Uh, but the retire doesn't hurt us as much, but they can get pretty big hands to guard our attacks. So yeah, I'll, I'll leave this as evening match. Then we've got ourselves Orphis here. So this would be Orphis, Orphis Regis. Originally, I thought we had a really good advantage over this, but after speaking with um, some of my, I guess, friends, <laughs> I don't know what to call it, um, on Twitter. I don't want to just say followers, because that's corny. Uh, after speaking to some people on Twitter, I think this is actually a little bit more evenly matched. Uh, Orphis is a little bit strange in that I'm assuming most of its hands is going to be orders. They're technically like turn four because you got to set up all your orders to actually be, you know, pretty dangerous. But they can kind of do stuff early game, especially with Shadow Armor tokens. Shadow Armor tokens can get fucking huge. Can't really do much about that. So we're just going to put this as even for now. Then we've got ourselves Seraph Snow here. Um, or Pure Light, I should say. So I originally thought this was like a really bad match. Um, part of that was just sort of my bias not really knowing the matchup too well and getting stomped on it a couple of times. But after playing the match more, it's actually a lot closer than I thought. Uh, I don't actually actually think Barrow does have the advantage. Because um, you can get around a lot of the shenanigans Prison can do 
just with how Barrow plays. Uh, the only real thing that would hamper Barrow is if they counter blast starve you and then try and deck you out. That is sort of a lethal tactic for Barrow because without counter blast we really can't do a damn thing. We can't pandemonium, we can't use Barrow's skill. Um, so that does suck and the fact that we soul charge so much makes it very easy to deck out. But we can very easily put Curtis in prison um, on grade two and get him back. <laughs> soul charge to uh, get going that way. We can very easily empty out our prison, let them beat us up or empty out their prison with our units. And we can very easily clap back. They are turn four. Uh, and usually we can whittle down their hand to the point when they ride pure light. It's not as threatening. We do lose a bunch of units. Um, but then we can usually come back. Goemon does really good work against this deck. So, yeah, I'm going to put this here. Next up, we have Flagberg. So my understanding is that uh, Flagberg has a bad matchup against Barrow. Um, somehow. But I actually think this is really even. Because... Um, I'm assuming now that, you know, Inlet Pulse is pretty much exclusive to this in Aurora. Um, people will start playing Flagberg more. Flagberg, as I've said, is really good. And, uh, it can kind of be dangerous for Barrow. Um, the thing is that its attacks aren't too threatening. Uh, unless you, you know, use one of the orders or in power note that way, then it can be pretty bad. But that takes some time to set up, so that's a little bit of a later game. Uh, it is a turn three deck, so it's active as soon as you ride Flagbird. So that kind of puts it on par with Barrow. But it also doesn't care too much about the big suck. It doesn't really play too much of a big board. It really just needs two cards to get its combo going, which is what makes Flagbird so strong. It just needs the Ascendance and the Inlet, and it can, you know, swing in that way. You can play the Price Trident, but that just goes to Soul anyways. Um, so I'm just going to put this here. I don't think it's a rough matchup. It can be a rough, rough matchup. They can go in and rush you. And for the most part, they don't... They, they get not punished for it because they could very easily just play those one, two cards that they need in order to actually get their combo going. Um, but yeah, I'll put this even for now. Then we have Magnolia Elder. Magnolia Elder is also even, I think. Without the Inlet Pulse, um, it's about the same as it was with the Inlet Pulse. It doesn't really make a huge difference to us. Us wrecking their board is devastating to them. But there are ways Magnolia can get around that with like Pantheros, uh, spiritual, uh, spiritual Body, yeah, Spiritual Body, stuff like that. So it's not the worst thing in the world for um, Magnolia. I think it might be slight advantage just because they do have to use resources to get stuff back. So maybe I'll change my mind. I'll put this here. Um, the five attacks are pretty annoying, but there are five guardable attacks, so that's the big thing. Barrel can guard normal attacks, uh, but if it comes to anything bigger than like 28, then that's a really big issue for us. Magnolia can get up those numbers with like Gnosias, but it's not super common, so I think I'll put this up here. We have the slight advantage, the board wipe does hurt them. Uh, they do have the tools to combat it, or not so much combat it, but come back from it, but it does hurt them a lot. Aurora is kind of the opposite of Magnolia. I'll actually put this even. I've played Aurora with Bastion a couple of times, and or with Bastion with Barrow, and it is uh, interesting because they have two very good uh, ways to rush you on grade two. Uh, they have the one basic style, which Magnolia Elder has been picking up on. A lot of people have been playing the Aurora ride line just to get the aggression early on, uh, in which case maybe it'll be even. But the War of Ride Line lets you get the two tokens, which is 210, um, a 10k column that can swing at you. They can also, on turn two, actually have the Raylina be active uh, and use that and actually do in, you know, a good amount of damage that way, get in multiple attacks. And uh, they can also be live on turn three. And again, use the Raylina, get in four attacks, do a lot of damage that way. So they can be lethal. The board wipe doesn't hurt too much. Because what they can do is they can have tokens on board. You swing in with your intercepts. They can just retire the tokens to buff up Aurora, dodge your attacks. Then when you swing in with your Barrow, uh, you come out with the other attacks. They still have the cards in hand to be able to guard remaining attacks. 
So it's a pretty even matchup. I don't think it's a rough match. Um, I would say it can go either way. It, I don't really think Barrow has the, is in favor of this at all. Um, so it's definitely even. And we got ourselves Orphis here. Um, so I don't know Orphis too well. I've played it a few times. Not enough. Um, so I don't remember matchup well, but after talking on uh, Twitter, seems the consensus is that uh, on most cases, it is here. So if uh, they don't have spiritual body, they don't have their things going, they kind of get stomped on. But since Zorga has a good early game and you know can use spiritual bodies and easily bring stuff back, it's actually a bad matchup for Barrow. So I'm actually just going to put it in between <laughs> and call it evenly matched. That can go either way because that's basically what I'm getting from that. And it kind of makes sense. The prison dragons are annoying. Get them coming back. Us putting stuff in soul doesn't matter because they use their drop. Um, them having the early game is really obnoxious, but also we can you know hit them pretty hard. Handful of orders can't guard with them. Uh, if they don't have any of their pieces, can't do anything. So, that is that. Then we got ourselves a couple of decks here. The last four. We we're gonna take Clarissa here. We're just gonna throw her up here. The reason I have Clarissa on this list to begin with is that pretty much every tournament I've been to, or not every tournament, but a lot of the tournaments I've been to, there's always been a Clarissa player. <laughs> Which is kind of interesting. I constantly see this, uh, just roaming about. So I just thought I'd, I'd throw this in there. And uh, it also is something that just gets eaten alive by Barrow because they have to have a bunch of units on board. Suck that in. GG. <laughs> I don't really have stuff on board for you to attack into, so it's a bad matchup. Uh, then we have Kyrie here. Grade 4 Kyrie. Um, Kyrie, I think, is a really bad match for Barrow. That's because Kyrie can be good early game. They can pressure you early game. Kyrie can be good late game as well so they're just really good at being aggressive we don't really like that too much uh they can also possibly get in some pretty big attacks which really sucks fire attacks really does suck it is a turn three uh turn four deck so my mind wants to put it here but it's at best evenly matched i think it is a rough match though um but uh, maybe it's more even i'm gonna put it as rough match i think it's a pretty rough match uh, just judging, because it, it really just depends on how the Kyrie player plays your deck. Uh, if they have early game pieces and they rush you down with it, it's pretty rough. Turn 3, they might not be able to do as much, but they can probably survive your um, your barrel turn. Then, uh, grade 4 Kyrie, they just really need 2 cards uh, to kind of get going. But losing the board kind of does suck, so maybe, maybe well, let's put it even. Let's put it even for now. And uh, next we got Lornel here. I think Lornel is still a bad matchup. Um, so it's kind of similar to Bastion, where they don't do too much grades one and two typically. Uh, it's really on turns three and then four where they're you know super dangerous. The thing is that we can't guard for big numbers usually, uh, but we can PG, you know Bastion Prime at least. Uh, whereas the Lornel. Shuts off RPGs and hits us with a crit, <laughs> which uh, makes us a really bad match because that's really all we got. We usually don't have many cards in hand. At most, it's just a PG or two. That doesn't mean shit, <laughs> right? So this is a pretty rough match, I would say. Uh, it's probably more likely here. I haven't played Lorno in a long time, to be honest. So this is more kind of comparing set three Lorno and set three Barrow. Uh, but we'll just put it here just on the fact that that guard restrict is really heavy for us specifically. Finally, we've got ourselves Bruce here. Uh, originally, I wanted to put this here because I got stomped by Bruce recently, and that's really the only experience I have with Bruce, <laughs> uh, to be honest with this with uh, Barrel Magus. So I figured it was here. Uh, in talking on Twitter, uh, I've been told that apparently, no, actually, it's up here. <laughs> Supposedly, Barrow shits all over Bruce. And I was like, I don't know about that, Chief, but maybe that's the case. I don't know. I haven't played it much. And again, I'm being biased because I got stomped on here. So I think we'll maybe put this in evenly matched just because using my criteria, uh, an unrivaled Bruce turn, I don't survive this ship. No matter what. Uh, they come in with brainwash swirlers, sand them, crits. Goodbye. GG, I scoop. Right. Uh, Final Rush isn't active on turn four either. So turn three 
they don't do much. This is a turn 4 deck. Barrel should have the advantage against turn 4 decks. He's a turn 3 deck. You can do a lot of damage turn 3. Uh, Bruce, typically what you do against Bruce is just rush him down. And Barrow has the capability to rush down because you have your Swirlers that you can play earlier. In my build, you can have Goemon. You have a shit ton of great tools you can slap down, try and rush them down, get some damage. You know, push them to like three, ideally. Uh, you play a bunch of crits so you can rush them down as well. Then, you know, you smack them with five attacks, huge columns, all this stuff. Uh, and you can typically wipe them out uh, while they're on Bruce. After that, got to fuck. Uh, then also, the big suck doesn't really play into this because they just get uh, their stuff in soul and then use it. <laughs> so that doesn't really do too much for you. But at the same time, they don't really hamper your game style. Um, the only thing they can do is if you rush with like a Swirler, they can counter blast Darview or they can uh, retire it with like Edens or something like that or just attack into it. So that's pretty much all they can do to hamper you. They have no way of really stopping you. Um, so maybe I'll put this here. Uh, I'll learn the matchup better and see if it's actually here. And that's it. That's basically the matchup analysis for Barrow right now, going to BRO um, before set six. That's basically it. This is sort of the most usual uh, combatants. You can take out even a couple of them, like Lorino, Clarissa. You probably don't see those often. But this is basically how it goes. Uh, as you can see, Barrow has a really, pretty decent matchup against a lot of these decks. And the ones that it has a rougher matchup is really decks that don't play it as often and it's only a few of them he doesn't really have a horrible matchup against any deck just by the near sheer nature of how barrel magus works that's why barrel magus has been really good since i won't say even set three but specifically set four he just bumped up automatically uh the only thing really holding barrel back is just rng you can deck out you cannot get your pieces not hit 15 um even though we're super consistent now we can't say undeniably every single time, every single game will hit 15, right? Whereas, like, you know, undeniably, uh, this will always get pure light more than likely, right? This will more than likely be able to get its crit and trick moves, right? They just have way more consistency. Uh, this can very easily get its overdress pieces. Uh, Magnolia Elder can very easily just play out its pieces, smack you in the face. Um, this is a little bit more RNG ish, but that's fine. Uh, TLDR, Barrel's pretty good, has a pretty good matchup against everything, and uh, doesn't suffer too much. <laughs> Just suffering from success over here. And that'll do it for the video today. To sum things up, to give you the quick TLDR, we've gotten two sets since DBT-04, Festival Collection, and DBT-05, but basically none of the cards that we've gotten there for Dark States have been able to support Barrel Magus. Not that I'm saying there's anything wrong with this, Barrel Magus is actually in a really good position right now as listed from the matchup analysis. It's still a very good deck and it has stood the test of two sets coming out. With set six coming out, I think things are going to change drastically for how Barrel can be played. Whether or not the current version of Barrel is the best version or if the future versions will be is still yet to be seen. I am, as I mentioned, very excited to try that out. But in any case, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Take care of yourself, play Vanguard, and have yourself a damn good one.